Right. Thank you. And so what I'm going to be speaking today is about this concept of age-friendly health professions education, how we integrate geriatrics into our healthcare training. Um, and then I'll give some examples from medical student and resident education, as well as um, interprofessional education. And I think Dr. Karani already mentioned my two disclosures. Um, so I just wanna begin with a story uh, of a patient like many of the patients you've cared for um, that I've had the pleasure of, of getting to know through my geriatrics clinic. And what struck me most about meeting this patient, I'm gonna call her Jane, is that her story is so typical of our aging population. She's 88, part of that oldest old cohort that's getting um, more numerous uh, despite the, the terrible, terrible times of the COVID pandemic. And um, Jane also is similar to many of her age cohort in that she has got multiple chronic conditions. Uh, and she, like most older adults, is juggling multiple different specialty appointments, multiple visits. And in my role as a clinician educator, I need to help trainees of all different levels take care of people like Jane without getting overwhelmed by her problem list. See, because when I'm working with a medical student or a resident or even a geriatrics fellow, and they see Jane's problem list, which actually doesn't include anything too unusual, but is quite long, it's quite normal for them to get overwhelmed and try to go problem by problem, but then they or Jane end up feeling frustrated and, and um, really unsure about how best to move forward. To, to help take care of her. And people like Jane, as we all know too well, and I know Sinai was an early epicenter, represent eight out of 10 of our COVID deaths in this country. And so the urgency of preparing all of our health professions trainees to take care of people like Jane, to take care of older adults has never been more urgent. And what's fortunate is that at this time of urgency, we have a new framework that can help us integrate age-friendly education and that's what I'm going to be speaking about today. So I know many of you on this uh, Zoom are already familiar with the geriatric 5Ms. Just out of curiosity, if you'd give me um, like a Zoom thumbs up, if it's a familiar framework to you, um, that'll just give me a sense. I I'm sure it'll be new for some of you. The framework itself was published in 2017. Um, and it was developed by Dr. Mary Tinetti at Yale and Dr. Um, Alan Wang and Frank Molnar at the University of Ottawa, which is actually my hometown. And they came up with the five domains that anyone caring for an older adult needs to consider. And coincidentally, the five domains that geriatricians focus on when we care for older adults. These are mobility, mind, medications, multi-complexity, and what matters most. So when I teach my trainees to take care of someone like Jane, one of the first things I teach them is something I learned at Sinai, the ability to toggle between uh, maybe the internist lens and the geriatrics lens, uh, going between the problem list and making sure she's getting evidence-based care and zooming out to the geriatric 5Ms to make sure that her care is aligned with her goals and is paying attention to the issues of aging. So I'll give you just a brief overview about this framework and then I'll be describing how we've integrated it into our curriculum here at Harvard Medical School. In each of the M domains, there are many different concepts. I'll highlight the top ones here. Safe mobility includes a focus on falls prevention, optimizing function, and identifying and mitigating frailty. The mind domain includes recognizing and managing dementia and cognitive impairment, delirium, as well as depression and other mood and psychiatric disorders. Medications includes looking at an older adult's medication list with an eye towards minimizing polypharmacy, deprescribing when appropriate, and thinking about how the physiology of aging affects their overall care. Multi-complexity is a particularly important domain in geriatrics. This includes managing multimorbidity, attending to caregiver stress and other psychosocial features um, that can impact an older adult's health, and complex topics such as prognostication that may affect our recommendations. And finally, and most importantly, attending to what matters most to people like Jean, making sure that we've appropriately prioritized their current care and have engaged in goals of care and advanced care planning conversations. 
So this framework has become a really exciting scaffold that educators across different health professions and within medical education have been using over the last few years to structure geriatrics education around a shared language. And I'll be giving you some examples. In addition to this framework, many of you may be familiar with the Age-Friendly Health Systems Initiative. And again, I'll be curious via a Zoom thumbs up how many of you are familiar with this. Um, started by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement here in Boston, the Age-Friendly Health Systems Initiative is a national quality improvement project um, that is now spreading internationally, aimed at integrating four of these M's throughout the healthcare system. The idea here is that in any healthcare setting, whatever your specialty is, Clinicians and healthcare providers ought to have a system to make sure that what matters to an older adult is assessed and acted on, that safe medications are assessed and acted on, et cetera. And the Age-Friendly Health Systems Initiative has been spreading through individual healthcare systems as small as one clinic or as large as an entire healthcare system, committing to do a, the quality improvement work to integrate systems around each of these evidence-based domains. So when we talk about age-friendly care for our trainees, what we're really talking about is providing a way to both teach the concepts to care for older adults and integrate them into the system of clinical care. I wanna add one other way of thinking about age-friendly education, which goes beyond teaching the specific topics to thinking about who we're teaching and how we're teaching it. And this is a concept of big G and little g geriatrics. Um, now, this is a concept developed by um, our wonderful colleague at Mount Sinai, Dr. Roseanne Leipzig, and another Sinai alumna, Kate Callahan and colleagues. And what they've written about is this idea that the big G geriatrics folks are folks like, like me and Dr. Karani and Dr. Soriano, who've done additional training in geriatrics, and this is our career path and our focus. But the majority, the vast majority of care for older adults in this country does not come from big G geriatricians. In, instead, it comes from the little g geriatrics providers, everyone in the healthcare system who needs age-friendly competencies to be able to effectively care for older adults. And this is critical because, as is well known, there are not, there are not enough progress. providers, providers nor, will there. nor will there. In fact, we know from um, the IOM report in 2008 that the projected number of just geriatric physicians needed, let alone geriatric social workers or psychologists, is tiny compared to the actual impact. And just to put a number on it, Dr. Louise Aronson in her book, Elderhood, has written about that number of around 6,000 geriatricians in the country um, compared to 70,000 pediatricians. Uh, so when you think about the size of that population, it's clear that while big G geriatrics is very important to train the, the next generation of leaders and, and researchers and educators and clinical innovators, really what our, we need to do in this country is geriatricize the medical system and geriatricize our education because more than half of uh, healthcare encounters come from that 15% of the population who are old. Um, and as we, as we are seeing during COVID, definitely the population that is bearing the burden of this. So what I'm gonna speak about is little g geriatrics, and I'm gonna give you some examples from the medical school curriculum, residency, and interprofessional education. And while a lot of my day job is focused on training big g geriatricians in my work mentoring fellows um, and training our, our geriatrics junior faculty in education, my focus today is on health professions education more broadly. And this concept of little g geriatrics of infusing these principles, the geriatric 5Ms and an age-friendly approach so that wherever an older adult encounters the healthcare system, someone like Jane will get the care that she needs wherever she is cared for. So you can see here on the screen, um, the original medical student competencies in geriatrics, which you can see were developed by a team um, largely from Mount Sinai. And um, these competencies were developed in partnership with the AAMC and the John A. Hartford Foundation and published in Academic Medicine in 2009. A few years later, parallel competencies were published uh, related to palliative care. And though my focus today is on geriatrics, there's clearly a, a beautiful overlap of Venn diagram um, as so many of 
the people we care for with serious illness or who are approaching the end of life are also um, older aged. In the past two years, the American Geriatric Society recognized the need to update the medical student competencies. In fact, the original paper said they'd be reviewed and updated in five years and we had passed the 10 year mark. Um, and because geriatrics and palliative care are not required parts of medical school education, the LCME, as I'm sure many of you are familiar, only gives a, a general requirement for teaching across the lifespan, but most medical schools do not have a required geriatrics rotation the way Sinai does. It had such a big impact on me uh, when I was a student. Uh, because of this, these competencies have been variably implemented and there is more research needed to understand the barriers to implementation at different medical schools. So in 2019, the AGS, the American Geriatric Society, formed a committee to update these competencies. And I had the honor of co-chairing this committee um, with Dr. Roseanne Leipzig from Sinai and Dr. Mandy Siegel from Cle Cleveland Clinic in Florida. And we, with our team, decided to reframe the competencies using the Geriatric 5Ms, both because this framework was being used by providers all over the country to develop clinical education in geriatrics, and because using this shared language would align with the Age-Friendly Health Systems Initiative. So you can um, read about the competencies. If you've got a smartphone, you can use this QR code to get to the full list. I'm just gonna highlight a couple of aspects to give you a flavor, and then I'll explain how we've been using them at Harvard Medical School to integrate into our medical student education. So the key about these competencies is, they, is that they are minimum competencies for graduating medical students. They are things that every doctor needs to know, whether they meet someone like Jane as the grandmother of the child that they're caring for as a pediatrician, and they need to recognize that she's developing cognitive impairment that may impact her capacity to care for her grandchild, or they meet Jane um, in a preoperative appointment as an anesthesiologist or a surgeon and need to decide whether she needs prehabilitation to minimize her risk of delirium or intraoperative complications. Every graduating medical student needs certain competencies within these five domains to be able to care for people like Jane. I'm going to highlight a few of the new competencies that weren't in the 2009 set, um, and I'm certainly happy to um, answer any questions about them. Some of the new competencies focused on the strides we've made in research on polypharmacy in older adults and characterizing phenomenon like prescribing cascades where one medication gets added to treat the side effect of another. Every doctor ought to be able to recognize and prevent uh, prescribing cascades. And the concept of deprescribing, which uh, really is relatively new and now has a national US deprescribing network, um, that sometimes deprescribing a medication can be the thing that helps an older person feel better. And that can be the most important therapeutic move. And so every doctor needs to learn the science of deprescribing and when and how to do so safely. Another new competency we added this year was in the multi-complexity domain, focusing on the importance of health equity and thinking about caring for older adults with an intersectional lens, thinking about how structural and social determinants of health, including structural racism, ageism, sexism, um, and other biases and, and forms of discrimination can affect how somebody like Jane ages, what sort of resources she has had access to, what kind of support her family is able to give her, and more. Another of the new competencies is in the matters most domain, where every doctor needs to have skills to elicit patients' priorities, not only for advanced care planning and end-of-life care, which as we saw during COVID is a critical skill, but also for someone like Jane, just managing her multimorbidity and figuring out what does she want to be able to do more of and how can our healthcare help her get there is so critical. We added new um, communication competencies uh, to help address the competency that every doctor ought to be able to speak to an older adult respectfully, including them in the conversation, even when they have a caregiver there. And competencies around sensory impairment, so common and yet often overlooked and not adequately covered in a medical school curriculum. So with all this competency work, which we were delighted to present in May of this year at the AGS National Conference, we had our work cut up for us locally here at Harvard Medical School. 
Now, it is no secret that Harvard has not been a leader in geriatrics education like Sinai has been. In fact, two very famous books by Harvard alumni highlighted this gap in their own training. Being Mortal by Atul Gawande and Elderhood by Louise Aronson, both graduates of Harvard Medical School, spoke at length about their gaps in their own training to make sure that they were prepared to care for older adults and those with serious illness. So when Harvard launched a new curriculum in 2015, I was delighted to get involved in geriatricizing the curriculum, figuring out how could these competencies be integrated to make sure that every doctor who graduates has the skills they need to care for older adults and to give Jane the attention that she needs. So the HMS curriculum, like many medical schools, has changed over the last few years where the majority of our preclinical time takes place in the first 14 months and our clinical training um, takes place in that green bar you see, the practice of medicine course, similar to ASM um, at Mount Sinai. And uh, following that, the students participate in a 14 month PCE or principal clinical experience uh, where they rotate through all their required clerkships, no, no geriatrics or palliative care as a required clerkship. And finally, they have um, their last 18 months of medical school focused on advanced electives, sub eyes applying to residency. So I'm gonna share with you how we have tried to make our curriculum age friendly and truly integrate these five M's of caring for older adults. And one of the principles we use is the concept of spaced learning. Harvard instituted multiple longitudinal themes that are to be woven through the curriculum in a spaced manner and are to address topics that don't fit neatly in individual courses and are critical for every doctor to know. The five societal themes that HMS announced in 2019 are health equity and health disparities, which dovetails with the important anti-racism work happening in the curriculum, trauma-informed care curriculum, substance abuse and pain, sexual and gender minority health, and the aging population and end of life theme. And these five societal themes match five curriculum themes that instead of an anatomy course or a pharmacology course, these now also have theme directors and are woven through the curriculum uh, using space learning. So the first thing we need to do in planning out our aging and end of life longitudinal theme, um, which I am fortunate to co-direct with a palliative care colleague, Dr. Kristen Schaefer, is we define the domains that we are going to focus on. We use the geriatric 5Ms and then three domains from within the palliative care competencies. I'm gonna focus on the five Ms for, for this session, but in our work at the medical school, we've been paying equal attention to both sides and as well as the center of this Venn diagram. The concept of space learning uh, is that when you learn something multiple times rather than all in a block, you have the opportunity to come back to, reinforce and deepen your learning. In this study here, you can see that the projected forgetting curve after you learn something new uh, is that by the time 60 days have elapsed, you're likely to have forgotten most of what you learned, no matter how engaging or important it felt at the time. However, with space learning, with reminders, whether they be um, emails that get you to fill out a quiz question um, or uh, clinical experiences, classroom experiences, reflective experiences can help bring that material back to the forefront. And so we adopted a space learning approach for integrating the five M's. And here are some examples of what we've done. So in the first year in the practice of medicine course, students uh, learn at first just the basics of taking a medication history, asking about adherence. They participate in a geriatrics clinical reasoning session where early in their experience, they get introduced to the idea of multi-complexity, that your typical patient who's old is not necessarily gonna come in with one medical problem but rather is more likely to be like Jane, that's super common. And so having the skills to navigate that is, is critical. Um, they participate in a home visit with an older adult uh, where they begin to ask those questions about what matters. And they, be, they participate in a longitudinal OSCE with an aging patient. And I'm gonna speak about that separately. Sessions follow on the mental status exam, on applying uh, safe prescribing practices to the hazards of hospitalization, a polypharmacy workshop at the beginning of second year, and followed by other curricular elements that, as you can see, return back to the same topics, but at a deeper level as the students progress through their education. 
One of the other tools we use to emphasize this space learning is a Geriatric 5Ms pocket card, which is a, a synthesis of validated tools for the assessment of older adults that any doctor could use pretty much on any clinical rotation grouped on the 5Ms. And um, this was actually developed by one of our students who came to us with an idea, with a proposal as part of the medical education course. And I remember taking the medical education course as a, as a student at Sinai when Dr. Soriano and, and Dr. Lisa Coplet were leading it. And, uh, and I'm paying that forward and, and seeing the, the wonderful things that my own students are, are coming up with, which has been very exciting. So we published the card in the Journal of the American Geriatric Society and subsequently a digital edition um, with AGS. And, and the idea here is that a lot of our trainees did report low confidence in caring for older adults. And a lot of the material is later in the curricula, but they need it um, at the point of care, even if they haven't yet had their session on capacity assessment, and they're gonna be asked to do that. And by really trying to synthesize what were the most important practical things they would need at the patient's bedside, um, we enabled them to come back to some of the learning that had been done in some of the didactic sessions. And our goal was just to help them improve their self-efficacy because people change by feeling good, not by feeling bad. This is a quote from the Stanford psychologist, BJ Fogg, who writes in his book, Tiny Habits, that if you're trying to train someone to do something new, they change by feeling good, by feeling a sense of accomplishment, by wanting to do more. And so if we can help our trainees feel excited about meeting patients like Jane and not dread that long problem list, but feel that they have something to offer by using the five M's, we can help them feel more confident and look forward to caring for older adults. So we, we give them the pocket card in first year and then they use it during their year on the wards. And um, most of them found it useful. Most of them are using it. Um, and we've now expanded that to our residents as well. Um, so, and this is some of our, our data. Um, so the card itself, uh, the more updated version is on AGS, but the PDF is still in JAGS. Um, and uh, it's been a nice way to see that even in this digital age, learners appreciate a laminated piece of paper that goes in their pocket and um, that they can pull out to remember, what are the things I'm supposed to check to evaluate if the patient is delirious? What are some of those high yield, high risk medications I should avoid? So that moving on from space learning, we'll now talk about another concept that we use heavily in our curriculum, which is the notion of flipped classroom learning. And many of you may know this term, flipped classroom learning, which refers to the idea that you flip the traditional classroom on its head. So in this traditional classroom, you come to class for lecture, and then you go home and do the problem sets or meet up with your study group. In flipped classroom learning, you watch the lecture online, you take notes, you ask your questions, and then you come into class and the teacher functions as a guide on the side, helping you do the uh, work through the cases in class and correcting any misconceptions. Flipped classroom learning has been shown in multiple studies to be more effective for retention of information, more enjoyable, and more engaging. And in a meta-analysis, it did show that there were improvements in um, student retention of information. So learning happens better when students are engaged. So um, a classic example of flipped classroom learning is assigning aquifer geriatrics cases. And I know one of the associate, uh, two, of the, two of the aquifer geriatrics team uh, are also at Sinai, um, Dr. Leipzig and Dr. Ramaswamy. And we found during COVID, when this resource became freely available, that the enrollment of students using these cases dramatically jumped up, as you can see um, in, in this graph. And uh, so we've been using that also to get the students to do a case about advanced care planning before they come to the code status workshop so that the level of questions they can ask in the classroom will be much higher. And then we started developing our own flipped classroom materials. One of the first um, videos I ever developed was with uh, a former fellow, Dr. Liz Fung, which was just a five minute video explaining the geriatric 5Ms, which meant that the students could watch that and we could then begin our discussion at the next level. Uh, and the, the most recent one that I'm very excited to share is one of uh, my fellows, Dr. Christian James. We worked together to create a video on mobility assessment in older adults. So now instead of using 20 minutes of class time to explain and model the chair stand or the timed up and go or the four stage balance test, we assign students to watch this video and then they come in ready to practice it. 
And so that class time can be used much more effectively. And especially in geriatrics where we've got such limited didactics time, it gives us an opportunity to use it well. Now, for classroom learning, you often need to do a readiness assessment to make sure that the students have accountability to prepare. And that's not always possible with resident or fellow learners who may have clinical obligations that make it difficult to participate in flipped classroom learning. But we found that in the preclinical years, uh, we've had good success at getting students to participate. The next concept I'd like to talk about in our curriculum is the concept of clinical competence. And many of you may be familiar with Miller's Pyramid of Clinical Competence, which reminds us that when we're trying to teach any health professions trainee, we're really trying to help them move from these cognitive levels of competence where they know how to do something or they know what the concept is up to the behavioral domains of confidence where they can demonstrate it and actually do it with a patient. And so we found some interesting results in some of our curricular innovations. For example, we developed a, um, from a polypharmacy workshop where we had the students do a simulation of sorting through a patient's brown bag of all their pills. And um, they, they took turns playing the patient and the provider. Um, we published the workshop in MedEd Portal. What we found when we did this workshop is that the student knowledge didn't actually improve that much. It turned out that the students, even at the beginning of second year, had a pretty good understanding of what were high-risk medications. So knowledge wasn't the major issue. Where we saw a huge improvement was when we got to the behavioral domain. Having done this simulation where they showed how to do a complicated medication reconciliation, the students' confidence in identifying errors and recognizing challenges and proposing solutions increased dramatically. And again, made them more confident and more likely to volunteer to do that med rec on a patient like Jane coming in with a long medication list. So here using Miller's Pyramid helped us put the emphasis on the behavior, the, the simulation and the doing rather than just on the knowledge because it turns out our students are, are very bright and, and they're able to get to those cognitive domains. We really need to help them improve their self-efficacy so that it can lead to behavior change. Another couple of examples of this emphasis on behavior are the My Life, My Story program. And a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to speak to the Sinai Geriatrics and Palliative Care Fellows about um, the humanities in, in geriatrics education, very close to my heart as an alumna of the Humanities and Medicine program. And so this is an example of a program where instead of just talking about the importance of the humanities, we actually assign students an interview with an older adult, usually an older veteran. We do Uh oh. I just have to hold on. I think Andrea's frozen. Probably jump off and come back on. You may not realize it. I think she has. I think she has. I think she was logged off. Hang tight, everyone. Stretch break. How many? I'm curious how many of you are familiar with this concept of the zone of proximal development. You can just give me a thumbs up. Um, it's one of my favorite medical education concepts. It comes from the psychology literature, and it's this idea that you don't want to be teaching to the zone where students can already do and already perform. Instead, you want to be getting to the, and, and you don't want to be overshooting to something they couldn't possibly do. You want to be getting them into this sweet spot, the zone of proximal development where they're growing and stretching and, and really um, being, being encouraged to learn something new. So one of the ways we did this is uh, through our longitudinal OSCE with an aging patient. And uh, you can see here a picture from an article we wrote about it for clinical teacher. Um, the students participate 
in a three-part OSCE, December, April, and August, where their patient, Sydney Bodell, ages by 10 years at each visit. And at each visit, there's a different um, issue that they need to deal with, whether it's knee pain or a fall or an elevated A1C. And we studied where the students were in their zone of proximal development. In first year, most of them could do very well with the chief complaint, um, but we saw that the zone of proximal development would be getting them to add an additional layer of focus on geriatric issues. And in the third case, recognizing a change in a lab value like the A1C, recognizing some of the psychosocial uh, components, in this case, um, that the patient's partner had passed away and had been cooking and managing the medications in this patient with diabetes. So throughout all of our medical school training, what we're really trying to do is integrate these age-friendly concepts into the medical education process that the students are doing. So that it's not a standalone, oh, now we're thinking about geriatrics, but rather when they're meeting an older adult, when they're meeting someone like Jane in any setting, they are thinking about these 5M concepts. So turning for a moment to resident education, the competencies for residents were published in 2010 and are about to start being updated by the American Geriatric Society. And these are only for internal medicine and family residents, and there have been subsequent efforts to geriatricize um, other specialties. And we developed a workshop integrating the geriatric 5Ms into primary care um, that was for residents. And this workshop is available on MedEd Portal. And at the end, I'll share a link with all of the resources we've developed in our toolkit. And what we did is we followed a patient, Mr. V, through four outpatient primary care visits. And we were able to increase our resident learners' knowledge by giving them practical tools. We used current curriculum design to make sure that we did a thorough needs assessment of our learners and set goals and objectives that fit with their needs, and that we developed educational strategies that were interactive, practical. We gave them an, an EMR template that they could use, and then we figured out how to implement it in a way that could fit with a busy resident schedule. So our pilot was a half day where they were able to block clinics, but subsequently, we do it in half-hour blocks that can be done in like a pre-clinic or post-clinic teaching. And then the, we evaluated both the workshop and the residents. And here's where we got them into their zone of proximal development. We really, really, we knew they already knew how to avoid polypharmacy. They just didn't necessarily have tools that could help them at the point of care. So we really emphasized the behavioral change. And in our immediate post-test, the residents thought that the tool they would use the, no the most was the fun digital tool. We taught them how to use ePrognosis, which is a wonderful web app. But actually, when we surveyed them several months later, what they used the most were the practical tools, the institutional resources, like how to refer to social work, how to get a patient a life alert button, um, and medication resources like deeprescribing.org. So we found that through this workshop, we were able to integrate these concepts into a busy residence workflow. Now, it looks like the Zoom disconnected, but can you still hear my voice? Yes. We can, Andrew. Okay. Yes. So I'm just going to talk you through the last piece as I reconnect, uh, which is integrating this into the inpatient setting. This summer, we implemented a pilot of an age-friendly inpatient bundle where we gave the residents a very small um, bundle for the 5Ms where they could actually implement uh, very quick and practical things when they were admitting an older patient. And so what we did was, um, and if, uh, if Alia wants to pull up my slides, um, I'll give you the slide number that we're on. Um, we are on slide 54. Um, for each of the M domains, we gave the resident a quick thing they could do. For mobility, just make sure you ask about baseline function and mobility, and do they need a PTOT consult? For medications, any high-risk meds we should think about deprescribing? Fermentation, what's their baseline cognition? What's their delirium risk? And we taught them to do the UB2, the ultra-brief delirium screen, which is the orientation today and months of the year backwards. And then finally, um, when we evaluated this bundle, um, we had 25 participants in our pilot, and only a quarter of them had even heard of the geriatric 5Ms or um, the age-friendly framework. 100% of them agreed it would be helpful. 80% of those strongly agreed. And um, interestingly, when we did semi-structured interviews, we found that they thought it would be very feasible. They're used to doing a bundle around code status or tubes and lines, and this would give them an opportunity to deliver age-friendly care at the point of care. 
So the last thing I was going to touch on, and um, I, I hope that um, I'll be able to reconnect and show you the slides, or, or maybe um, Aliyah is able to, to pull them up. Uh, the we're the last them. thing them, is Andrew. wonderful. Thank you. So we're on the slide that says Little G Geriatrics, focusing on interprofessional education. So for interprofessional education, there are competencies that were developed in 2010 through the Partnership for Health and Aging that every trainee in any health profession should know about the care of older adults. And we sought to implement those um, on slide 57 through an age-friendly symposium for interprofessional trainees that we published in the journal of the American Geriatric Society last fall. Um, and you'll recognize um, Omar Amir as a, a Sinai colleague, a former fellow of mine um, on, on this list. And what we did on the next slide was create a half day workshop. In our pilot, we had 10 different professions. We've since done it with even more. Um, and on the next slide, you'll see what we were trying to do was integrate the IPEC competencies, the interprofessional approaches that help us make sure that we are really delivering care as an interprofessional team that learns about from and with one another. And on the next slide, you'll see that we use the principles of adult learning theory to make it a really engaging and memorable day building on prior knowledge and experience, making the learning relevant and applicable, and learning through problem solving. On the next slide, um, if you use the animation feature, you'll see that there were four parts to the symposium. There was a welcome, just kind of framing the activity, followed by speed circles, um, where the trainees were invited to share what inspired them to work with older adults and uh, to get to know one another. On the next slide, you'll see that we then had each profession explain their training path and what is their role on the geriatrics team. Um, followed by, if you click one more time, you should be able to see that the trainees were distributed into five groups, one for each M domain. They all worked on the same case um, in their interprofessional teams and then came back together to share what they had learned. On the next slide, you'll see a grid we used for this case where for each M domain, each, per, each um, profession had the ability to think about how the M's relate to their profession, and also within each domain, how each profession has something to add. So you can see hopefully an example from audiology that the audiologist might think about how hearing affects fall risk under mobility, but also how mobility affects hearing. If the patient doesn't have the dexterity to clean their hearing aids, um, they're not going to be able to do that task without assistance. On the next slide, you'll see a pie chart of who all the different professions were. And uh, we met our goal, which is they, they emerged with a better understanding of each other's professions and uh, a deeper appreciation for how to deliver age-friendly care as an interprofessional team. So I'm excited to share that um, we've had a publication accepted that will have all the materials for this workshop available, including all the slides and, um, and handouts. So we hope um, other institutions will be able to use it as a model for interprofessional geriatrics education. So that actually brings us to the end of what I wanted to share. Um, we've gone through the concept of age-friendly education and big G and little g geriatrics, as well as examples from medical student, resident, and um, interprofessional education. On the next slide, you'll see a next step slide where I can share that what we're working on next, um, if you click through the animation, is the little g geriatrics of really trying to change the system. Um, so looking at the implementation of the new um, AGS geriatrics competencies, um, spreading this age-friendly bundle for the wards, continuing to disseminate the pocket card. And we sent out a national survey that maybe some of you even responded to called Project Edge um, to get a, a better sense of what's actually happening in US medical schools, uh, because the last survey was almost 20 years ago. And then we're doing a lot of work on the big G side as well to teach the teacher. We've got a fellows medical education curriculum and peer to peer teaching with a surgical residents and a forthcoming textbook on geriatric medical education um, that we're uh, looking forward to uh, sharing in the spring. And so um, on the next slide, you see a picture of Jane again, and that brings us back to where we started, that ultimately all this educational work is meant to help us take better care of Jane, that no matter our profession, no matter where we meet a patient like Jane, that we should be able to look beyond her problem list. And if you click the next animation, we should be able to look at those 5M domains to make sure that we're attending to the aspects of her care that'll help her do more of what matters to her. Um, so on the last slide, I just have some acknowledgements. I wanna 
thank all of you for your patience with the rocky technology today um, and uh, my many teachers uh, on the call who gave me such a wonderful foundation in both um, geriatrics and education at Mount Sinai, as well as some of our um, funders, including the HMS um, Dean's Innovation Award that, that helps support this work. If you hit the um, animation one more time, you'll see a QR code and a link to a toolkit we've put together with all the materials we've developed. And I work at the VA, so these are all um, federally funded things that are free to share and, and use. And I'm always delighted to um, talk with people interested in, in adapting the materials. So um, that's the end of my presentation. And I want to thank you all for bearing with me. And um, I guess I'll, I'll, since I can't see the chat, I'll, I'll ask um, Dr. Karani if there are any questions that have come in or, or anything that I can answer in our last few minutes together. So, Andrea, first off, you, you already win our award for being adaptable and uh, really just <laughs> not you. even skipping a beat. Um, and if you could see the uh, room, you could see you're getting lots and lots of Zoom applause which we will unmute ourselves later to give you uh, in person so at least you can hear it. But uh, I will turn it over to folks. If you can raise your hand for me so that I know it can call on you for questions for Dr. Schwartz. Would you leave up that uh, URL for the, um, the reference that was up before the, the, the QR code? We'll put it back up in a second, Joel, for sure. Uh, thanks. Yeah, it, it links you out to a Padlet where um, there are links to the different materials by different topics. All right, any, any questions?